start. We have 23 people online. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Virginie Hiver. I'm a Eurodis Therapeutic Development Director. And I'm very happy to welcome you today for this uh, webinar in preparation of our uh, Eurodis Roundtable of Company, which will take place uh, in 10 days, the 26th of September in Barcelona. So thank you for joining. Today we will have the pleasure to have a presentation on the background you need to have on European Reference Network before coming to this workshop. And I have the pleasure to have two speakers today with me. Uh, Victoria Edley, who is Air Action Climatic Coordinator from Newcastle, and uh, Matt Bols Johnson, who is a Healthcare and Research Director at Eurodis. So, thank you to both of you. Uh, just for the work plan of this webinar, we will have Vicky and Matt going through the presentation during half um, an hour. Also, and then we will have time for question and answer. So please keep your question for the end of the presentation. You will have the opportunity to interact either with the chat box that you have on the left of your screen, either to raise your hand and speak and ask your question directly to our speakers. So thank you very much again for joining. And uh, now I will let the floor to our speakers. And uh, Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Virginie, and welcome everybody to the webinar. It's a pleasure to be to be joining you today. Um, I work in the Joint Action for Rare Diseases, RD Action, and Eurodis are a key partner of ours in all of this work. So it's a real pleasure to be part of this of this web uh, webinar and to join you indeed on the workshop at the end of the month. So as Virginie said, what Matt and I want to do really this afternoon is to give you kind of a whistle-stop tour of the essentials of ERNs, what we call ERNs 101. So tell you what these things are, where they came from, where they are at the moment. So this is the operationalization. Matt's going to talk a bit about unlocking the potential of ERN, so taking you through a couple of maybe concrete cases and the kind of clinical situations that the ERNs are going to, to address and improve. Um, Patient involvement in the ERNs is increasingly important. It's, a, it's, it's one of the key strengths of the network. So Matt will give you a bit of uh, information on how your orders are managing this and how the patient community is organizing itself. And then finally, we'll end on a, just for a couple of minutes talking about some of the, the shared policy challenges. Um, and an interaction with companies is extremely important in those discussions. So without further ado, uh, introductions to ERNs. If you already know a bit about ERNs, then I'm sure you will know a lot of what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes. But we really want to be able to get everybody to Barcelona hitting the ground running so everybody knows what the networks are, where they came from. And that way, when we get to Barcelona, we can launch some more detailed discussions. So at a basic level, an ERN is a network connecting providers of highly specialized healthcare. It's what we've always called centers of expertise in the rare disease field. And these networks have been set up and were always intended to be set up in areas like rare diseases and specialized procedures where patients and expertise are scarce. It's important to stress that this concept didn't come from nowhere. It's grounded in a, a legal uh, document in the Cross-Border Healthcare Directive, which stipulates or clarifies the uh, situations under which European patients can seek healthcare in a country other than their normal country of residence. The key principle of the ERNs is that wherever possible, the expertise will travel, not the patient. So it's important to note that actually under the advent of ERNs, um, patients in Europe have no more rights, shall we say, to move across the border to receive uh, a treatment or a drug or a therapy than they do at present. Um, there are more important ways that we expect the ERNs to positively influence those situations when patients do have to move. But essentially, at the heart of the concept of ERNs and what they will offer, it's all about virtual expertise, virtual exchange of knowledge. And it's also important that you are all aware, I think, that although this concept really took off in 2011 with that directive, it's actually been in the planning for a very long time. And in fact, originally it was Eurodis who really spearheaded this concept and thought, hang on, this would be a great solution to address some of Europe's rare disease problems. So it's been going for a long time. And I do want to stress right at the start that the success of this and the fact that now we're not talking 
theoretical, we're talking actual networks. It's really because many, many people, many different stakeholder groups have really pulled together, and this is an excellent example of pan-European and, and pan-stakeholder collaboration. So just to give you a summary, um, those who are really keen can or may already have dissected all of the many legal acts which tell you exactly what the networks need to do and need to be. But just to give you a summary to refresh your, your memories, these are the basics of what the networks have to do. They have to have knowledge and expertise to diagnose, follow up and manage patients because as I said, first and foremost, these networks are about care. They need to be able to demonstrate evidence of good outcomes for patients. They have to ensure a multidisciplinary approach. They need to have capacity to generate good practice guidelines and to implement outcome measures and quality control. They need to be able to collaborate with other expert centres and other networks. So not every centre in, in Europe that could be part of a DRN is part or ever will be. It's designed to be a sort of a hub and spoke model, but we'll talk about this in a moment. And last but not least, they have to have the ability to demonstrate world-leading research, teaching and training. So it's a really broad mandate. It's a very ambitious mandate. Um, and this is basically what the ERNs are replacing or slowly replacing. Um, in the past, you had a huge landscape of projects in Europe which were funded under various uh, programs, but they tended to be dedicated to a specific disease or a specific group of diseases, and they were largely research-focused. But there was a real issue of sustainability. Some of these have managed better than others to sustain themselves after that funding ended, but generally a lot of these things kind of fell into, into disuse. So who will benefit from ERN? There are many, many benefits. Um, and the first beneficiaries, in a way, are actually the people who were involved in all of those projects that I just showed you on that, that very busy slide. For the clinicians and the researchers who already have networks, that already built up networks and were, you know, they knew each other, they, they collaborated well, ERNs allow them to sustain what they've already developed, but to make it better, to make it stronger, and to know that actually they're not going to expire. Because one of the key things to, to appreciate about the network networks is that they are, in theory, permanent. They're not going to close down after a couple of years. At the same time, um, as you'll have seen from that, that slide that I showed very briefly, it was a real patchwork, but there are many, many diseases and disease areas in rare diseases, if you think about 8,000 conditions, that actually were not covered by those projects. So ERNs done well will be the ultimate equalizer. They'll fill in the gaps because they've been set up at very broad disease levels. So for patients, as I said, the, the benefit is really around equalizing access. It means that if you're not lucky enough to live right next to the European expert in your rare condition, that's not going to hamper you from getting the best possible standards of care and the best possible care access, because in fact your local physicians and your local teams will be able to access and tap into that expertise of the network, so you won't be disadvantaged. For a company, pharmaceutical industry, uh, medical devices company, this is the, the, the crux of what we're talking about in Barcelona, I hope you'll appreciate that ERNs are really a ready-made community of very visible experts, so we know which healthcare providers are members of which networks. You have patients involved, you have all the stakeholders, you have the member states backing these, these networks, and it's a great opportunity to have permanent, visible clusters um, dedicated to specific conditions and groups of conditions. And as well, I mentioned earlier that actually nothing technically has changed under the cross-border healthcare directive. People are no more um, permitted to, to seek care abroad than they are at present. We know that in rare diseases that can be very difficult and actually persuading your country's authorities to allow you to go and get a, a, a treatment somewhere else when you need it is a major issue for patients. We're hoping that over time the advice and the perspectives of the ERN experts will grow to a, a point where actually um, you know, HTA bodies, payers, insurance companies will take note of the advice of the network to make sure that scarce resources that our countries have are actually used much smarter. So this is quite a busy slide and I'm not going to go through all of it, but I think it's important to show you that these networks have not come out of nowhere. They are very much um, grounded in policy and legislation. That began officially with the directive in 2011. And after the publication of that directive, there was a lot of work by the broad rare disease community in Europe to put some meat on the bones, because actually 
what the directive says about ERNs is quite brief. It's quite a skeletal concept. So recommendations were generated to, to explain what an ERN should actually do, what it should look like, who it should involve. I won't go through all of these, but an important point came with this, um, rec the addendum to these sorts of recommendations, which was generated in 2015. And that document is, is fairly short. We can put links on, on it, um, on the, the chat perhaps to it later. But essentially what this document did was it, um, it highlighted the importance of meaningful, concrete patient participation in the ERN. And Matt will explain more about this and how this is being achieved later. But it also proposed a grouping structure for networks. So I said in the past you had, you know, EB networks, you had Duchenne muscular dystrophy networks. It was clear that actually if you were going to try to set up an ERN for each of 8,000 diseases, it, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be feasible and you wouldn't get the, the, the economy, the scale and the benefits of that collaboration. So what we did in the joint action and in the USAID and the Commission Expert Group is we came up with a list of ways to break down a broad disease field into about 20 or so headings. Broad headings like rare cardiovascular, rare neurological. Now, once we had all of, these, um, all of these headings, we had to try to support the very broad rare disease field in Europe to actually organize around these. Because a crucial point about the networks is that when this call went out last year, um, early last year, we were all, um, it was made very clear from, by the Commission that in fact these were not to be competitive calls. They didn't want lots of different metabolic applications, lots of different rare pediatric cancer applications. So in the joint action, one of our, our major roles throughout a lot of last year and at Eurodis was to bring together communities and to help them to organize themselves. And this was a massive, massive undertaking. It was really very successful. And actually, we have to you know, put a lot of the, the, the credit to this for, um, onto the, the, the coordinators themselves and the clinical communities. We expected to maybe get 10 or 12 proposals in that first call, but actually um, everybody really exceeded expectations and 24 proposals went in, so even more than we'd initially expected. And all of them were officially approved um, by the very beginning of this year. I'll show you some nice slides in a moment of the official launch and kickoff. To give you some stats and an idea of the scale of these networks, these 24 networks, they involve around 370 hospitals and almost 1,000 highly specialized units. That's because, of course, a major hospital, somewhere like Great Ormond Street, will have many, many different areas of expertise, and so different units can apply to, to join, officially join, different ERNs. 26 members, uh, 26 countries are involved at the moment, so that's 25 member states and Norway, but I'll give you a nice slide in a moment breaking this down. And um, what I always emphasize is that it's interesting that the coordinating healthcare providers of these 20, uh, 24 networks are all actually based in seven countries, but we'll look at this in a second. So this is the very nice, um, this is the, the, the official birth of the ERN. This was the official launch conference in Vilnius, Lithuania um, earlier this year. And as you can possibly see, those of you who know your, your European politicians, um, there's tremendous political support uh, at the European Commission level for the ERN. They really are a huge success story in very difficult, challenging times when you know, the future of health in Europe and the future of European collaboration is truly at stake. That's not an exaggeration. ERNs demonstrate a brilliant example of countries all coming together, different groups of people coming together to work for a greater good. So. This is something else that I really wanted to stress in this presentation, that these networks are not only permanent, but actually they are very well supported and very well regarded by the, the powers that be. I'm not going to give you an introduction to all these different networks and what they do and who's involved, but you can follow these uh, links. We have a, a very nice page created by the European Commission. We also have a page which our project RD Action um, created where you can actually click on each network. It's a bit small to see here, but you can look yourself via the link and you can read about who's the coordinator of each network um, and get a sort of a five page summary of what the network's actually doing. What might be useful for some of you in your day-to-day -day work actually is to follow this, this, again, it's a commission link where you can actually search by country and you can see which ERNs the country's involved in and which healthcare providers are involved. Or you can search by network, so you could look at the rare bone network, for example, and you could find out which countries, which centers are official members. 
because there is very strict criteria to be officially a member. We'll talk about other possibilities in a moment. So this is the application overview. Um, these are some nice figures which our, our your orders colleagues have, have generated. And really, I just wanted to highlight this to show the kind of geographical scope of the networks. Um, we have almost all of the member states involved, and those that aren't at present um, have the, the potential to join in the next calls. So it's really good coverage. As is possibly expected, the, the bigger countries, a lot of the Western European countries, um, are involved in all or nearly all of the networks and actually have quite vast numbers of um, participating healthcare providers. But still, it's worth pointing out that we do have some of the Eastern European countries that are quite high up here as well. So the Czech Republic is involved in many, many networks, Poland. Um, and obviously, the next challenges for the networks is to see how we can actually consolidate membership in some of the countries where there's fewer and how we can expand it where there are no members at present. So before I hand over to Matt, who's going to talk a bit more about you know, where we are at present and what are the next concrete steps, just to sum up a little bit between the difference between the so-called pilot networks, the projects that we had in the past funded by the FP programs or the health program. The pilot networks were usually based solely upon research, whereas ERNs on the right-hand column, they are very much healthcare focused, but they have a very strong research goal too, so they have to do the best of both worlds. The pilot networks were very much single disease. Now we're in the realm of very broad diseases. Not all of these networks will address all the diseases under their heading right from day one. It has to be a stepwise development. But in theory, this is what will happen over time. They will expand their disease coverage. That's very important in terms of creating and generating valuable links between specialists who may not have worked together previously, but also in sharing data and seeing how data generated on specific conditions can be pooled to elucidate patient cases from related but, but slightly separate conditions. I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to point out that, again, these are permanent networks. They're not time bound. Permanent assuming that they pass their first assessment, which will be in about four and a half years' time. Um, they are rooted in legislation, and they will be assessed and monitored by member states and by the European Commission for all sorts of different levels of performance and quality control and impact. So um, that's my last slide on the very basic introduction of how we got here. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Matt, who will talk to you a bit about what the networks are prioritizing at the moment and how they're actually going to work. OK, thanks, Vicky. Um, so with N the networks were launched at the beginning of this year after the application process. And um, it will take them a bit of time to establish themselves. It won't be on day one uh, patients will be referred for specialist advice. Any uh, big institutional merger like two hospital trusts coming together, you lose about two years of business because internally they're sorting out internal relationships, processes, re-establishing uh, and sorting out their governance uh, arrangements. So the networks will see a similar growth uh, of establishment. Um, so in year one, this slide uh, shows, um, I mapped this slide about two years ago, and uh, we are seeing actually year one, the establishment of these internal relationships, the organization of the governance uh, frameworks uh, for the networks, sorting out and developing the internal referral pathways um, and how case reviews will take place, and the establishment and implementation of the IT platform, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is the um, CPMS, the clinical patient uh, management system, which will be launched uh, and operationalized in uh, the beginning of 2018. Um, by the end of this year, uh, the networks will have a, a new call for new members, full members, uh, which uh, the application process and assessment will take place uh, the first six months of next year. So we'll see the membership of the uh, networks um, expand uh, midway through 2018. So the slide which Vicky showed where we see a very strong leaning to um, uh, six countries uh, in terms of membership, that will start to balance out and we'll start to see more uh, um, countries being in all of the networks um, across the board. So as you can see, that's the, 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 the I, I, our view of how things are developing and will continue. Um, so these networks are new bore, new, newly born networks, and they're very much around sorting out, organizing their fine, uh, funding opportunities, applying for calls, which are the European Commission are putting out for registries or research, et cetera. Um, uh, they're looking at um, how they work together to, uh, between research and healthcare, mapping 
exercises are taking place in uh, across all the networks, what research activities are taking place, what in the network, what um, uh, educational activities are, are are in the network which could be shared more broadly, what care pathways are in place, or what's the evidence base out there. Um, so we we're seeing that um, uh, networks are understanding what each of their um, members do currently and how that can be brought to a network level. Um, what we also, uh, there's different types of membership for a network. Um, there's a full member status of a network which has to go through an assessment process through the European Commission. Um, but um, where, where a, a centre in a country, or a country doesn't have the expertise of, let's say, doing 50 bone sarcomas a year to demonstrate competency, um, they, 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 they want to take part in that network under bone sarcoma or, or soft tissue then they could join a, as a, an affiliated partner to, to learn and get the expertise from taking part in the network. So affiliated partners is a second type of membership to the networks and, and uh, we have none at the moment. They haven't been uh, uh, identified or endorsed. It's a member state competency and it's something which will only be done where the, there isn't a member from a country in a network. Um, so. The CPMS system, which I mentioned earlier, um, it's very much for about case review where there's a complex presentation in the network they want to discuss between five or six centres. Um, and that information will be uploaded, scans can be uploaded, and uh, potentially that can be retained and stored. Uh, data is anonymised and synonymised, and um, there's a potential for that to be reused in the future, possibly for research. Um, which isn't the case currently. Um, so the whole data and what data, what minimum data set is being looked at now, uh, what's the referral pathways and criteria for the networks, and actually being clear on what is an ERM patient, where, when should a patient be referred, and that's very different depending on the disease area um, and the level of expertise in each of the countries. So, so this is a development stage of the networks as, as, as we uh, implement them. Um, so I just wanted to say why I think uh, the, there's so much interest and excitement about these networks now. And really, at the heart of these networks, there is, um, as a patient community, we say great potential. Before, we, uh, experts were uh, scattered across Europe, cases were scattered across Europe, and by joining that expertise up and seeing centralization of those cases, we, we should be able to see improvements to the care and treatment which is being given in the network because the, the, the total network uh, has, a, has, a, has a greater um, uh, knowledge base to draw on. So in a way, I say that ERNs are more than the sum of their parts. So the collective brain of an ERN is more than each of the members uh, individually put together. Um, so, just to illustrate how an ERM would work, if you have a patient, let's say, in Germany, in Cologne, with uh, Ewing sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma is a very rare sarcoma, and uh, a, a centered in Germany might only see three or four cases a year. Um, so, that patient goes to their local hospital, in, in, let's say, in, in Cologne, and, um, and they contact their uh, they don't have, they've never seen that presentation of the Ewing sarcoma on the little boy on, it, on his fibula. Um, so they, they, they link into the network and they're centered in the network which have seen that presentation before and they say, well actually we saw one of those last year and what you don't want to do is this. And that, it, it aids the guidance of decision making of treatment and approaches. And that's where this real knowledge and learning can be shared through the network. So for us, for patients, you know, 10 years in the making, this is our unmissable opportunity. It is the point in time for the rare disease community, a historical moment with the establishment of these 24 networks of one new central infrastructure. The, the, the level of collaboration we're seeing across Europe between clinicians, between member states is massive. So we, we have the potential now to have the critical mass of patients and data to push research to push clinical practice, to, by knowing who the experts are, because they've been through a process of validation and assessment at the European level, who are the experts, 
and, uh, and that visibility enables me as a patient to get to see that person quicker and that reduces the diagnostic odyssey. We will um, be looking to see that the clinical and research communities and patients are connected up and really turn um, what experiences out there to start generating value of knowledge, uh, not just generating knowledge, but generating value of data um, and learning within the networks. Uh, we see that just by making visible the care outcomes and treatment outcomes within centres, that in itself will be a driver for quality and clinical excellence um, because it encourages clinicians to know when one practice is better than another, another and to adopt it. And we can see really that uh, ultimately this new infrastructure at a European level that more and more um, uh, European activities will be hung off it because the networks were, are expected to do quite a lot of different activities. Um, so really what's the value of a, a European reference network? Well anything at a European level is, a, is actually doesn't exist out of any one member state. So a, an initiative at a European idea should be driven home as a benefit within each country. So the value of a European network is to develop and encourage national networks to take place and national care pathways to enable patients to access them. So ERNs shouldn't happen in a darkened room in Brussels, but should be an, uh, anchored into national health systems. And we should be building on that foundation uh, as a bottom-up approach. So to generate that type of knowledge and learning within the network, um, the networks can set up peer review forums to share uh, expertise which they're having. The, the case, virtual case discussion are, um, uh, are there as a learning environment as well for the experts for, for these rare diseases. But also trying to create a culture of learning in the networks. So how any form of feedback is used to drive improvements. And that could be from a, a, a serious incident, patient experience or surveys. What we want to see is how the networks respond to that level of feedback to drive in improvement. So there's two examples here, which I won't go into. I'll go, I'll go into detail on the second one more. But there's two case studies of, of how that generation of learning can take place. So you can read this slide um, uh, uh, when you download the presentation. But um, and I, I led uh, the development of a, a national network in the UK, and we saw 20 to 30 percent of improvements to outcomes to patients, just because we agreed simple outcomes for each of the centres in the network to to collect and then compare to each other. So these simple outcomes, which are on screen, enabled the surgeons to see when one. Uh, uh, developed their surgical philosophy around removal of uh, vestibular schwannomas and taking them out earlier. And, and they started to adopt uh, um, uh, and try a new cancer, uh, a cancer drug, a vaccine on non-malignant tumors under a research protocol. Uh, we saw huge improvements to care for, with the application of that medication. And so the learning which was generated because you could have simple outcomes of the common currency to see when the uh, variation in clinical practice, when one practice was better than the other, and it, it was easier then to, to, to adopt that and, and benefit from it. So Vicky mentioned earlier about this isn't, these aren't um, networks, aren't single uh, professional networks, they're multidisciplinary networks, and it's important that the patients are, uh, and the clinicians are, and researchers are working together in these networks. So whilst the the clinical community were encouraged to organize themselves under 24 networks through a, a European uh, um, Commission call. The patient community uh, didn't have that incentive or the uh, uh, structure to, to, to uh, um, structure themselves. But the addendum, which Vicky mentioned earlier from the USO recommendations, gave a very clear direction that these networks should be patient-centered, that patients should be in the governance of these networks and on the network boards. So Eurodis went out and worked with uh, our members, but also the wider community to develop patient advisory groups. So we've now developed 24 of them. So these patient ad uh, uh, advisory groups are, uh, have, uh, are sitting all the governance committees, network boards, advisory groups of these 24 networks. Um, they're open to members and non-members of Eurodis. 
and they're aligned to the scope of each network. So we have uh, the adult cancer network, uh, we have patient representatives taking part in each of the disease-specific clinical committees overseeing the disease-specific uh, uh, um, or cancer-specific networks um, to, to work with the clinicians. We've got 150 patient reps currently, um, and uh, we're still going out finding more patient representatives to ensure that each committee and working group has uh, patients involved in. And each of the clinical leads very happily put patients on the network board and have them as voting members. So that gives a clear indication that there is an equal voice of patients in these networks. Um, so we, we've been having, uh, we had the satellite meeting here to the Eurodis uh, membership meeting where we brought the EPAG members together to do training uh, um, and capacity building. Um, it was the first one. Urologists want to continue to develop the uh, capacity of patients to, 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 uh, be, uh, to optimize their engagement into the ERNs. So the, what we're doing, webinars uh, specifically to align to the workshops under the joint action on the, the core areas where the networks are getting support to develop interoperability in their approach. Um, we're also setting up, the European Commission set up a, a network coordinators group um, and underpinning that they've set up seven working groups for one for research, one for ethics, etc. So you're obviously also going to be organizing um, transversal focus groups aligned to those working groups at a European level uh, to be able to uh, ensure that those uh, uh, European Commission uh, net, uh, working groups can link in with uh, patient representatives. So um, the patient representatives for clinical outcomes, um, all the patient reps in all the networks who sit on the working groups in the network on clinical outcomes and guidelines can come together, share their knowledge and how things are developing in the different networks and link into the working groups at a European level. We do peer coaching which in, on a quarterly, quarterly basis, which is with the clinical leads of the network as well. And we've also set up a, a mentoring program uh, for patients to support them. So I think that's where I stop and hand over to Vicky. So, yeah, thank you, Matt. So I'm just going to finish off for the next couple of minutes by, by um, highlighting some of the policy support and development work that's going on around the network. So you've heard a lot there. You've heard about how the networks came in to be. Um, you've heard where they are at the moment, the sort of scale and coverage of the networks. Matt talked a bit about the, the kind of operationalizing priorities of the networks right now. And this is very much sort of practical, operational things like establishing their governance, um, establishing how they fit within health healthcare systems, um, seeking different methods of funding, and I see we have a question about this we can address um, just in a moment after we finish the slides, um, expanding membership out to different countries. So this is all crucial work. But alongside that, there is a real recognition that actually the networks are brand new. But the people involved in them are not brand new. And many people have been working for a long time in rare diseases and specialized healthcare and research and data standardization. And what they want to do is to bring together all of the identified good practices and the easy wins to help the networks to actually address, although they're all looking at different diseases, to address what they can address in the same way. So to share good practices around things like clinical, pra uh, clinical practice guideline generation, registries, um, conducting clinical trials, feasibility studies. And my project, um, RD Action, which you wrote us, as you know, are, are our key partners in, We've been trying very hard to, to work with the networks ever since they were sort of ticked off and approved to, to help them to generate some policy-based guidance. So we do this through um, a series of workshops that we've been organizing. And as Matt explained, um, you know, this field in terms of the actors involved is changing all the time. A really positive development that's happened lately is that actually amongst those 24 ERN coordinators who have the weight of the world on their shoulders right now, they've sort of divided themselves up into um, topic-based working groups, and as Matt mentioned, the ethics group and the research group, both of which will be very important for, for, for our, our meeting in, in Barcelona. So we're working with them in the joint action, that's our logo. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through the previous workshops that we've delivered, which are focused around the ERNs, but I'll give you this link and you can follow this link and you'll come to this page where we have a list of all the different workshops and the different outputs we've created. There are some useful ones there. I think this one around 
that we did almost exactly a year ago, actually, we delivered this workshop on sharing data for virtual care that looked at everything from how you do virtual consultations and virtual reviews, which is at the heart of the networks. It also looked at um, ethical and legal and social issues around data protection and data sharing. But it also looked a lot about some good practices to enhance data interoperability. So that last part was actually kind of followed up in a, a workshop that we did in April this year. But I will leave these for you to have a look at, um, ideally if you can, before we all meet in Barcelona. This is just the full list of the workshops that we, we have delivered. These are our green ones and the ones that we have yet to deliver um, over the, the rest of the, the project, which is just under a year. As you'll see there, I can't really highlight this, but the one just under purple is um, an idea that we've had for some time. We've been very keen to work with the coordinators and the commission and the patients and the member states, huge multi-stakeholder collaboration, to really explore structured strategic collaboration between ERNs and companies and also between ERNs and regulatory bodies, HTA bodies, etc. So a lot of that is about you know, learning what the ERNs do, but also really drilling down to the key points and the key moments where collaboration could work between these different players, what the needs and priorities would be on each side to have a harmonious, mutually beneficial relationship, uh, and what we need to put in place to make this happen. So. Um, I'm ending on this slide, which is our legislation slide, before I hand over to Matt for the final conclusion, just to, to, to really make you all aware that actually from the joint action perspective and certainly the coordinators themselves, a couple of whom will be with us in Barcelona, we're very keen to, to, to try and figure out how we can um, move forward to manage the expectations and to, to optimize the opportunities for interaction with the ERN from industry, from companies, um, and also later on in the year from the, from the EMA. So far, um, you can find out everything that's been written and everything that's been produced on this specific topic if you have a look at the concept paper which was distributed, which Matt um, has done a lot of work on this year. This has been sent to everybody in preparation for the workshop, but that will highlight some of the key policy documents and the legislation we have at the moment. So an important one is this one on the right, which is a statement produced by the Board of Member States of VRN on some of their key hopes and expectations around the engagement with industry. So um, I'm going to hand over to Matt for one final slide before we open up for questions. So, so really, from a patient perspective, what do we look for for these networks? Well, these networks really offer hope to us that actually the people who are living with rare disease in Europe, 30 million people, um, that their lives will be improved because the networks will connect up uh, uh, the national healthcare systems um, and all the expertise across Europe so we can access uh, that expertise faster um, and get uh, uh, quicker access to diagnosis and treatment. But we want to see also really that there's an increase in of evidence base generated and then also an increase in adherence. So treatment decisions are given more against what is uh, seen as best practice. We, we, we hope that uh, uh, there will be an acceleration of the pace of research because data will be um, uh, connected up and shared. And really, ultimately, for a lot of rare diseases, not just uh, the few that we have uh, new therapies for all rare diseases being developed and that uh, we can have better access to those therapies. So I just want to say thank you for Vicky for supporting this webinar um, and uh, that's uh, thank, thank you. you for thank attention. you very much to both of you Vicky and Matt for this very comprehensive and uh, crystal clear presentation. Uh, so now we will move on to the Q&A uh, part. Uh, just uh, two points before we start. Uh, as I said previously, you have uh, several opportunities in the audience to provide us with questions, either by using the chat box on the left, and we do already have one question there, either by raising your hand uh, using the button that you have on the top of your screen, and then we will open the floor for you, and uh, you can ask your question. In terms of the question, uh, you're obviously welcome to ask questions to our two speakers, but also if you would like to submit questions for the workshop uh, itself, we will also gather some questions in particular for the discussion in the morning with the representative from the ERN networks of coordinators. 
So maybe to start with the first question that was uh, um, written in the chat box by Catherine Beaverson. Uh, it was about one of your slides, uh, Matt, where you were explaining uh, the year-end scope, and uh, Catherine was asking what is meant what is meant by funding opportunity. Uh, so, if you recall this um, this slide, that yeah. yeah. Right. So um, uh, the the European Commission have get, uh, put out a final, uh, have, there is support for each of the networks. Each of the networks gets a grant every year for five for the first five years um, to support their coordination activities. The networks coming together, develop, uh, developing how they work together, and sharing their knowledge. Um, so there's. There has been a number of other calls which have gone out uh, by the European Commission. There was one on, for registries, which, uh, which are, these calls are specific to the ERNs. Um, so the networks themselves have put in applications for new funding uh, uh, opportunities, like uh, the call for registries, where a number of networks will be supported to uh, develop their registries, which they have. Um, there's been calls under Horizon 2020, for um, uh, solving the unsolved was a recent one. So the networks are coming together uh, to to look at those funding opportunities coming from the European Commission to be able to um, uh, uh, get uh, additional funding to develop their uh, infrastructures and how they work. Um, Vicky, yeah, just like to, to add, I mean, you know, the money question is always crucial. And for, for many years before the actual creation of the ERNs, a lot of people raising the very important question of well, how are these networks going to be funded. The problem, if you want to call it that, is that in Europe, all of the you know, member states, you are responsible for your own health care. So health care is very much um, a member state responsibility. The Euro European Commission has limited um, powers or rights to, to, to interfere in that. So the centers which are part of an ERN will very much uh, continue to be funded in their day-to-day -day activities by their, their national um, authorities. But where the Commission did come in and say, okay, we will support this, is in the, you know, making the magic happen between the centres. Because, as I'm sure you're all aware, coordinating a network of, you know, in some cases, up to 70 odd centres, most of them are not quite that large, but they're, they're, they're much bigger than the initial 10 centres in, in, in eight member states, which was the, the bare minimum here. These are large networks, and that takes money, it takes dedicated people. So at the moment, what we have is, as Matt said, each of the networks has, I think it's about 200,000 euros per year to do that coordination money and that goes to the coordinating centre. But actually trying to, to find um, sustainable funding to do all the other activities, at the moment it's a bit of a piecemeal effort. So as Matt mentioned, there are calls relating to um, creating registry, either setting up new registries or linking to existing ones. That call was through the public health programme and we don't know the outcome of that quite yet. There's other funding, um, for example, through through a, another framework which supports um, the the healthcare providers and actually connecting to this central shared platform. The platform itself, the clinical patient management system, which is what will share the clinical data and allow these virtual consultations to take place, that is being provided by the European Commission. So that's part of their, their contribution to making this happen. But absolutely, we all know that, that money is essential. Um, and, and although the networks have a huge, broad, ambitious mandate, at the moment, there is not really the funding there to sustain that. So they are looking for how they can have a sustainable um, funding system moving forwards. Thank you. Uh, so we do have another question. I will read for you. Uh, will ERNs also facilitate patient input into early drug development programs for their disease? UPATI does a great job at building capacity, but it is still not clear when and how patients can actually be engaged by companies. Maybe something that ERNs as ready-made community of expertise could address any plans in that direction. I guess there is a lot that we will discuss on site as well. I don't know if you have comments so far on this. So um, in terms of the expectations of ERNs, the, the, they, the legislation says that they both need to be patient-centered and empower patients. And um, there's two documents. Vicky showed the um, the delegated decision and implementation decision, the legal framework for these networks. 
um, there is a, the delegated decision uh, is, uh, is um, sets out the different standards the network should do in terms of criteria. And then that, that was expanded for the assessment process in the operational criteria, which is, uh, was a really helpful document. And in reading the operation criteria, what the networks need to do to, when they, when, uh, to demonstrate, patient engagement and involvement is throughout all the activities. Um, your auditors have just done a summary, a one-page summary of the types of activities that the networks need to engage with patients to support. Um, uh, and that is through the, um, the uh, early uh, drug development pathway, um, through uh, um, recruitment in, in clinical trials, right the way through to development of um, uh, uh, guidelines, etc. It's, it's through all activities. So I do think they have a responsibility to do that. Um, how that is done, um, uh, we need to look at those different options and develop best practice around that to steer the networks into adopting uh, current knowledge base and experience from new patty in different places. So I think it, I think it's there in its uh, in the spirit. I think we now need to look at how we can do it in a practical way. Thank you. Um, yeah, don't hesitate. Uh, thank you for submitting a question in the chat box, but don't hesitate to raise your hand as well. We would like to hear your voice <laughs> as well. Uh, maybe in the meantime, I have another one from George Reynolds. Uh, have we an expected date on when the patient consent forms will be released? So this is this is the, the patient consent forms um, for the virtual consultation. So we mentioned a few times throughout this this webinar that actually providing care and providing virtual care wherever possible is at the heart of the networks. To do that, you need a shared common platform through which people can do what we're doing now, um, essentially, but do it a little bit more technical, a bit cleverer, and far more legally secure because you'll be sharing information on patients. So it, depending on the kind of um, case you're looking at, sometimes it might be um, the sort of thing that they do in fields like some of the pediatric cancers, for example, they have these sort of virtual tumor boards where all the experts come together at appointed times, they share images, scans, um, information, summaries, etc. Other times it will be very much people sort of logging on, experts from the ERN members logging on to review cases in their own time. Either way, clearly, patients need to actually provide their consent for this to happen. So that consenting will happen at the local level with their local clinicians. Um, to make things streamlined, because everyone will be using the same system, uh, the European Commission authorized a, a tender with some, uh, some legal experts to come up with a, a sort of standardized consent form. So a kind of a brief information sheet for patients, because if you imagine you turn up at your your healthcare provider and, and your, your physician says to you, look, you know, I think actually I'd like to call upon the expertise of the ERN. They might say, what, what on earth are you talking about? Because actually there's not broad public knowledge yet. So there's an information sheet which summarizes that. And then on the other side, you have your consent. So you have to consent for your information being shared within this um, virtual review. And then you can also consent to having your data retained or stored somehow within that platform. I think that the, um, the documents have been finalized and they were um, submitted. I think the tender officially finished its work in July, August. So actually, this should be released very soon. The timelines for the provision of this clinical patient management system have really been um, quite tight. So the company providing this, they were asked to prepare you know, an initial launch, an initial product ready for operation this summer. And actually, I think it almost is ready for operation. So the networks have been testing it. They've been you know, accessing it and, and trying to do the virtual meetings. However, they have a few more years in their contract to sort of make tailor-made adjustments for each of the networks to see what works, what doesn't, and to, to amend that. Um, but of course, they need, before patients actually start to go through the system, you need to have the consent forms ready. So. If they're still on track to be to be to be starting this, this these first meetings, you know, any day now, then I think actually the forms will officially have been cleared, but they're probably still making their way through the through the, the commission's um, official program before they become launched or you know, publicised anywhere. Thank you. Um, another one. Uh, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that the patient advisory boards are made up by a representative? cross-section of patient advocates. I guess it's about EPAG's constitution. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, so um, we we did a call originally for patient representatives to come forward, take part in the ERNs, and we had 85 patient uh, representatives elected. And um, when we talk about 24 networks, um, when we talk about 24 networks, it it, it doesn't it, it sounds a lot, and they're quite big with a nearly a thousand healthcare providers. But really, the 24 that they're, it hides how big they are. The 24 networks is actually 150 the specific clinical networks, which are underneath the umbrella of 24 thematic networks. So we've got 150 clinical committees overseeing uh, those networks. So what Eurodis tried to do was to ensure, let's say, for rare pulmonary, that rare pulmonary as a thematic network has 10 disease-specific clinical networks underpinning it. And there's a c committee uh, overseeing each one of those disease-specific networks. So that each one of those committees, we have a patient representative or two members of. Um, and so we have uh, rare pulmonary, uh, 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 rare, um, th uh, primary ciliary dyskinesian uh, network, um, pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis, metastelioma. So we have patients from that, those communities um, sitting on, on those networks to discuss with the clinicians on specific uh, 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 on those specific conditions and uh, um, so so we we have now covered about eighty percent of those committees uh, with patient representatives and um, so so the mechanism for that to take place going forward will be we, we continue to recruit um, and there uh, it's open to the whole community. Um, like with the clinical communities, there was some um, uh, the clinicians which stepped forward to take part in the network applications because they saw the opportunity. But then there was other experts which didn't come forward in the beginning. So as the networks establish themselves, now there's a, the second wave of, of, recruit, of uh, applications for net these ERNs will be mm -hmm. December this year. There'll be another a, a big increase in the membership of these networks from the clinical side, and and I think as time goes on, we'll see that increase from the patient side as well. We need to work with the clinicians in the different countries to to identify their patient organisations to get them involved. So we all start working as as a as a community uh, in uh, at large, really. Does that I answer the question? So. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay. And and you got confirmation oh, from Walter. Fast. That's perfect. Uh, so we still Thank have a couple know. of minutes. If uh, there are some additional questions, you can, uh, as I said, you can always raise your hands or type them. And uh, also, if you have questions that are coming uh, to you after this webinar, don't hesitate to uh, forward them to us. We will uh, uh, use them in preparation of the breakout of the afternoon or for the discussion during the day. Anybody wants to react now? Or everything was super clear, everything was. An additional one, how rare genetic subgroups of a large disease, uh, like with the ROS1 translocation in lung cancer, uh, considered as rare disease? That's a tough one. <laughs> That's an interesting one. I mean, technically, the well, but this is a good, a good point to make um, at this juncture. Actually, is that you know I always talk about rare diseases and ERNs being for rare diseases, firstly, and they are. But actually, they're beyond that. They're actually for you know procedures and any conditions where a, a highly specialised approach and high, you know a concentration of expertise is needed. When we're talking rare diseases in Europe, of course, we're talking about that 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 you know no more than um, five per ten thousand figure. So I think, I mean, Matt, what, I don't know as much about the cancer ones as you do, I, I, but... I, 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 yeah, so, so I, I think it, it's actually quite easy. So European reference networks aren't solely rare mm. disease networks. They're, 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 they are networks to be developed where there needs to be a centralization of expertise or resources or knowledge um, for highly specialized healthcare, or complex condition, uh, conditions or presentations. So um, you, you uh, want, uh, for um, something like diabetes, which is very broad, 
they could be a very uh, small subpopulation of diabetes, which actually those patients should be seen in the rare uh, endocrine ERN. The 24 networks which have been established so far have been predominantly rare disease networks because I think the rare disease community have been working together for a long time and have seen this opportunity coming. But some of the networks are more highly specialized yeah. surgery networks. The urogenital network uh, has, uh, uh, is, is very much more in that uh, uh, vein. And uh, also, I think the um, digestive diseases one is. And, so, and we have also a, a network for a rare genetic um, uh, uh, tumors which are uh, at risk of cancer. So that covers hereditary breast and, uh, uh, and colorectal um, uh, uh, conditions. Uh, which are pre uh, uh, higher risk of, of, of cancers. So, so actually, the not not everything fits into the box of the approach which the RD action and the uh, use of recommendations on the thematic areas for rare diseases. And actually, I think that there is some interest in uh, that the, these 24 aren't aren't the end of the story. They're the beginning, with m some member state representatives looking more that we should be focused on developing more of the uh, highly specialized uh, um, uh, healthcare networks now uh, broadening out more from what we've got in terms of the rare surgery. So I do think when we talk, look at rare conditions, um, rare presentations or uh, subtypes, like you say, for, for, for rare lung cancer, I mean, some of those things I think will obviously come to the fore uh, um, yeah. quite soon. So I, I, I think it will go in that direction. But we, we have to establish these 24 first, really um, maximize on their opportunities and the success of them. Um, and as Vicky said at the beginning, the political interest of this um, is, is very high. And the European Commission uh, are looking at these networks as a sign of European added value because of the level of collaboration. So, And this model potentially will be looked at developing yeah. in other Actually, areas. Actually, the rare, the rare cancer um contributions to all of this are really very strong. So you do have the genetic tumor syndrome network, and you'll meet the coordinator of that, actually, in, in Barcelona. But we also have um, a pediatric rare cancers and adult uh, rare cancers as well. And, and for all the other networks, all the other disease-focused networks, actually, pediatric and adult is all classed in one, but, but there was an exception made for the cancers. So, so you have you know, three very strong cancer-focused cancer -focused networks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are reaching the, the end of this webinar. Uh, so first, I would like once again to thank you both, uh, and Matt, for your participation. And uh, also all the people that are online, thank you for the question. Do not hesitate to come back to us, as I said, if you have additional questions that come uh, after the webinar. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all in Barcelona in 10 days. And thanks again. So have a good afternoon, everyone.